everybody's heading outdoors. Here's how to get started camping with kids. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. So Tamara, before we get talking to our guest all about kind of some tips on getting outdoors and enjoying camping during these crazy times, I know that you took advantage of kind of the social distant outdoor vacations and you guys went glamping recently. So do you want to give our listeners a little update about your guys's glamping trip? I would love to, because, you know, that's about as far as we go in terms of camping. <laughs> we ended up going to New Hampshire for a weekend. It's the one state that I'm allowed to go to right now. And it ended up being perfect timing because the fall colors were really just beautiful. Um, not quite peak, but but getting close. And we stayed at a place called Hutchopia. It is a, a French company, and they're also in Canada, and there's two here in New England. So it's Hutt, like H-U-T-T-O-P-I-A. Uh, and it's really a glamping, camping resort, I guess you would call it. So there's a whole lot of different tents on platforms. Some of them have bathrooms with a small kitchen, and others are you know, more basic tents. And there's also chalets or cabins. And it's all, you know, situated on a lake and there's a central lodge area where they have an Airstream trailer where they do some food. And there's also like a game room and they have an outdoor playground and basketball court, volleyball, like sand volleyball. And down at the lake, you can rent either canoes or stand up paddle boards. So you can definitely spend a lot of time there on the property or you can go out and explore um, so it's kind of a little bit like you and I have both stayed in an under canvas. Mm -hmm. So a little bit like under canvas, except I would say from a design perspective, right. not <laughs> as luxe, you know, like a little bit more utilitarian. Um, but I had that same do, thought, like when I saw your pictures, I was like, okay, yeah. so it's, yeah, it's definitely a little more the utilitarian, like kind of, you know, almost serviceable camp that you picture like a, you know anthropologist using or something. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Archaeologist. That was what I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah. You're definitely not walking in and going like, Ooh, wow, look at that. You know, it's, it's not, it's not a full bed. It is. Um, so our, our tent, I will tell you, we rented a trapper tent okay. and it was supposed to be on a brook, but it was basically like a ditch because it's so dry right now <laughs> that there was no water in it. And it was just because we did it like a month ago and there was limited availability. So if you wanted to get something like lakefront, you are, you need to book out way far in advance. So it's basically, it's a, you know, it's a tent on a platform on the front porch. You have a little propane two burner stove that you can use to cook. And then there's two like camp chairs that you can use. And in front there's a campfire ring. So you have, you know, a couple chairs you can hang out there. Um, and inside the tent, it's, you know, it's pretty large, actually. When you walk in on like the left, there's like a dining area. There's a table with four chairs and a little um, one of those like portable coat rack things with some mm -hmm. hangers. And then on the other side, there's a little kitchen. And so it's really just kind of a small sink um, a fridge, like a little bit bigger than dorm size fridge, and then some shelving that has, you know, your basic pots and pans and utensils mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So, you know, it is like fully serviceable, whereas like the under canvas, I don't think that there are any that have a kitchen. No, and they don't even um, let you bring food like in your tent. You have to keep it in the car or you have to check it in with them at their, at least the the two that I've stayed at, you have to turn food in either to them at their main hut or keep it in your car. Yeah. So you have, you know, you have that. Um, this was a little bit more like for something right now when you're looking to be more self-contained mm -hmm. and to take care of your own meals like that worked better. Um, and then in the, then basically past that area in the tent, it was almost like in the middle is a, a very small bathroom. Like, so nothing that had the feel of like the under canvas with the nice sliding barn door or anything. It was just, you know, a small door, teeny little sink, 
toilet that like you almost had to sit sideways for your knees to fit and not rub against the wall in front of you. And then like a tiny stall shower. That's like one of those little phone booth kind of stall showers. But hey, you know, like hot water, you know, yeah. towels, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. That's my then on either. <laughs> yeah. On either side of the bathroom, there were and the, the bathroom actually had like walls. It wasn't um, a canvas wall. It was, you know, a, I mean, thin, but it was still like a wall. And then on either side were the bedrooms and I'm using like quotation marks for bedrooms. So it's basically like I kind of called it a tent within a tent because it had like flaps that you would fold down, you know, to cover up that bed area on either side um, mm-hmm. for a little bit of privacy. But there wasn't really much space to move around the bed. So on one side, it's a queen bed, which is really like just a, a platform with one of those rubber covered camp mattresses. <laughs> Um, you know, like, like slightly thicker than a cot mattress, but certainly okay. not, you know, you're not talking about like a bed with a box spring and all of that. Okay. And they left you like the, the towels and the duvet and the blankets. So you kind of had to make up your own bed and like the flattest pillows ever. So luckily we always travel with our own pillows now. <laughs> so, yeah, so there's that area. And then on the other side, like where Hannah was, it was a full bed with a twin bunk above it. So you could definitely fit a whole family like nicely and have, you know, some separation of space and you don't have to bring your sheets. You don't have to bring your towels. um, You don't have to bring too much in terms of crockery or things, you know, for making meals. So it was very convenient in that way. It was just, yeah, it was just basic, you know, like I said, utilitarian. So glamping, but more in that I would call it camping with a bathroom in the tent. (laughs) You know what okay. I mean? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah not but like the whole, luxe, but just, right, you know, serviceable. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with the glamorous, but, um, but very serviceable and, um, you know, and the whole like resort kind of area was nice because, you know, you have the lake there. There's lots of things that you can do. There was food if you wanted to get it in the morning, they do like coffee and crepes. And then in the evening they have either pizza or there's like salads or I think like nachos or hummus or something like that. So like kind of basic. And then there's a little store where you can buy like wine or beer. But we ended up, um, we got a crepe the day that we were leaving, but otherwise we just made our own food. And Glenn actually got a big kick out of doing his coffee out on the porch in the morning. (laughs) But beforehand, of course, he had to grind his beans at home and he still brought his little scale so he can do his pour over and all that you know, fancy coffee stuff that he likes to do. But it was, it was really fun. And I was really worried especially that Glenn wouldn't like it because he's not done even the under canvas. You know, we did do the the tent in the desert, but that was different. You know, that was definitely very luxury and it was such a unique experience that I don't think it's going to be on quite the same comparison chart, you know, mm-hmm. as a, you know, camping in the woods kind of thing. But he really, really liked it. And he was That's actually amazing. like, we should do this again. We should do this with another family. Like, what if they got like a tent or a cabin next door and then we could all hang out together. And yeah, so he really liked it. And I think it was, it was just nice. There was no Wi-Fi in the tent. There was cell coverage though, if you needed it. And there was some Wi-Fi at the, um, the lodge. And we ended up, our tent was actually very conveniently located to like the parking lot and the, the lodge. So, you know, it was easy to get to, which is good because we got stuck in so much traffic going up there that we got there when it was pitch dark. And I was oh. kind of freaking out because we just kept hitting like accident after accident. And I'm like, oh, so we ended up getting there like an hour and 15 minutes after I had hoped. And I'm like, well, even if we got there at seven, there'll be like a sliver of light still. But we got there at like 740. So by the time we were checked in and getting in, you know, we're with the little, uh, headlamp that I brought or our phone things like trying to find like, is that our tent? Is that how do we get into it? And you know, it's until you can get inside and it does have electricity. There are lights. Two of them were just kind of like hanging. I don't even know how to, I don't even know what they're called, but they're like those lights that you would hold if somebody's like working on a car and you needed to see in there. Like, you know, like those lantern, like brat, like, yeah, yeah, like the cage lights that hook. Yeah. So they were like (laughs) just hanging there and then, you know, like a very bright, like one light, um, but there was no lights outside. Mm. And uh, yeah, so we had that, but it did have like one plug and I brought like one of those small power strips to plug in our, our phones and things. But so it, like I said, it had a little bit more than something like an under canvas, but it, a little bit less in terms of the style, but I would totally go back again. It wasn't, I mean, it, I don't know, it's kind of crazy 
the price that they can charge for these things compared to like, I guess, just a campsite. But I don't even know what campsites cost. But it was like, I think $200 a night. But, you know, I don't know. Whole family with the kitchen kind of thing. Like, like what would you compare it to? Like staying at like a residence in? Residence you know? in. That's, yeah. Yeah. Like a, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. But we had a cool experience. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, that's nice. It's you guys, you know, it's, it's great. You guys have, it seems like you've been pretty busy. I feel like we've been just at home, but you, you guys have been well getting some experiences. It was all about like, I want to fit this in before, like, I'm just, I have this deep, deep fear in my stomach of, of, of winter. And also when we booked this, we didn't know what school was going to be like, yeah. is it going to be virtual? When is it going to start? We didn't know anything. And I was like, let's just do it. And I'll be honest, this is the first time since Hannah started high school that we have gone away on a weekend and it kind of freaked her out because she's very much a kid that like wants to spend as much time as she can like doing her homework and some of that is that she also might spend the entire day doing her homework while FaceTiming with friends and therefore Mm. not always the most productive use of time (laughs) but the minute I tell her like oh you only have four hours to do your homework because we have to do something for the family she's like wah you know so you know she was a little bit freaked out especially when I told her there's not going to be any wi-fi but because uh, Monday was Yom Kippur, and even though we're Jewish and obviously observing it, yeah. we weren't going to temple. Uh, Glenn was just running the temple Zoom. So she did have all day on Monday to kind of catch up on her homework. And so I think that made it doable, you know. So it was kind of like it was a three-day weekend, but we we're taking two days of it. So yeah, well, I'm good. not sure what other travel will be in our future for a long, long time. As yeah. you can hear the sadness in my voice. I know. I'm I'm hoping to I hope California starts opening. I mean, I know this sounds crazy because I'm still in Washington and we're still like we're finally moving into where maybe they're going to start hybrid schooling and maybe we'll start moving into our county might be able to move into phase three. But, you know, I would love for Disneyland to open up and can, since the girls are doing remote schooling, be able to go down there for a trip as long as it's kept at limitations, <laughs> you right. know, on numbers right. and because it sounds like Disney was doing a pretty good job of keeping things wrapped up and it would just be nice to get some sunshine yeah and your schooling is like when it's virtual is not like all day like when hannah is on her like she's you know doing like eight days virtual eight days in person yeah so when she's doing her virtual days like she's still online from 8 a.m to 3 10 yeah that is so exhausting i'm so glad our school did not do that because it's i don't see how that can be healthy for kids, you know, in a way. So yeah, we we just have three classes, they're doing it like a college course. So it's just three classes get done in one semester. And then the next semester, the are the other three classes. So in a year, they'll have six classes, but they're moving at a faster pace. And then the three classes only meet on live for 30 minutes. And then they have an hour afterwards to work through homework and reach out to their teacher if they have a question. And um, yeah, so it's it's really nice to just have those you know, three 30 minute sessions, and they're not even required for attendance credit, because there's some kids who are, you know, in childcare, or who, you know, don't have Wi Fi. So they've tried to make other ways that you can attain attendance that doesn't require joining the lives. So it's actually really flexible. It's so sad, because it's so convenient for us to be able to travel right now. But, you know, we're kind of just (laughs) stuck in a way we could we we should definitely I should just get around and plan something else for in our state I think it'd be fun to do something yeah Hannah actually likes doing the virtual because then they do give them longer breaks in between classes yeah Um, but she tends to then FaceTime with friends but she feels (laughs) she she actually gets like more time with friends and and it's also just nice to have a break from wearing the mask all day because when she's in school she's going from school to like a bus out to the athletic fields and then soccer. So she's on, you know, she's on and she has her mask on for like 10 hours straight, you know? So I hope she's changing them just because they get so wet and uncomfortable. I I do give her a separate one for, for soccer. Yeah. 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 Yeah, It's, it's a lot. I mean, it's all getting crazy. They're, they're getting to start. It's funny though, because typical teen, right? They're, talking about starting, well, we're starting up hybrid for like preschool and special needs. And then they'll slowly bring in like kindergarten through second. And maybe by the 
you know, second semester, they might go in person for secondary. They haven't decided yet, but they're going to give the option that you can stay remote if you want. And Lizzie, typical teenager, wants to stay remote because she likes not having to wake up at 640, you know, 6 a.m. to go for a 645 bus. So yeah, she's like, she loves it. She like wakes up at 9 a.m. for her 940 class and she's so happy. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing. We'll see how it all works out, but it's certainly an interesting time. Yeah. Well, and, you know, for those that can still get out, even if it is only on the weekend, uh, camping is the way to go. It really is. It's like you're out in nature and you can control so much of your environment, which is really nice. And I I will go back to what I always say about travel. And, you know, it, I experienced it again this past weekend. And it's just the change of scenery that makes such a difference, right? Like we're together all the time. Yeah. But there's something so different. So it's not, you know, it used to be like, oh, well, we're, everyone's so busy and you just want to have like family time. And like now it's more about like you have a lot of family time and sometimes you might even be sick of each other. But when you're having family time in a fun, different environment, that's not your house where yeah. you are going to school and working and all, everything else. It's just really, really good. Yeah. Really. Good. I agree. Getting out of your bubble makes a difference, even if you're doing some of the same stuff. Yeah. Well, let's chat with Catherine all about camping and kind of inspire our listeners on how they could maybe get up and go and plan a outdoorsy vacation. Sounds great. We are here this week with Catherine Ryan Gregory, and she shares travel hacks and kid-friendly destinations to de-stress family travel. She founded the family travel website To and Fro Fam and is the author of Virtual Travel Activities for Kids. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here. And you're joining us from somewhere on the West Coast. Where are you based? Yeah, I'm based just outside of Portland, Oregon. Oh. How, how have you been managing with the <laughs> fires and fires, things? Yeah. It was scary there for a bit. We ended up evacuating and left for about five days. And thankfully, our home and community ended up being safe. But um, the the smoke, honestly, was just as bad (laughs) as a a challenge as the encroaching fire. But thankfully, now the skies are clear, I can see the sun, I can breathe the air, and we can all go outside and play. That's great. Yeah, I, I was thinking of all of you guys down near Portland. I'm in the Seattle area, and it was brutal up here. But you know, when we were in the 200s to 250 air quality, you guys were like in the 400s. So I was like, I can yeah. only imagine because it was brutal for us. I mean, it started coming into your house even where you couldn't even stay indoors. It, it seemed like it was seeping in. Yeah, absolutely. It was hard. And then at the same time, I think of all the people um, who have, you know, lost, lost their, their homes, homes yeah. and businesses, um, their livelihoods, and my my heart continues to go out for them too. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully yeah, they can really recover. Terrible. That's tough. And I imagine for you guys, you do so much camping. Um, I'm glad that you were, I guess, close to home when this was happening, because that's, I guess, another little bit of a scary thing that could happen when you're disconnected and you're, you know, out at a campground, but. Can you tell our listeners, I know this summer has been like the summer of camping for you. What kind of camping do you enjoy? It's been a while since we've talked about it. We've kind of talked about like RV camping and other types of camping in the, in the past, but I'd love to hear like, what kind of camping do you enjoy with your young kids? We do just about everything. Um, We haven't ever rented an RV and stayed in an RV ourselves, but um, my husband's parents live in an RV full time. And sometimes we join them for camping. And also sometimes the kids go camping with just their grandparents leaving my husband and me to have, you know, a few days um, without without the children, which is always nice. But primarily um, with our kids, we do tent camping. So we'll drive into a campground where we can set up nearby. But we've also done camping inside just the car without a tent. And that can be um, actually a quite easy way to get started because you don't have to deal with nearly as much of the gear. And setting up camp is literally just a five minute project. That's exciting. I was looking, I was on Instagram the other day and I saw one of those like custom mattresses, you know, for the back of a car. And all I could think was we just went glamping this past weekend and I brought so much stuff in the back of my car. I'm like, well, what would I do with all the stuff? If I'm going to take up the back. (laughs) 
Yeah, that's that's a really good point. The I most recently went camping in the back of my car um, out in eastern Oregon, and I ended up putting a couple of the things that I had stored inside the car, a few things in the front seat, and then a few things just outside of the car. You know, nothing, no food because that can attract animals. But mm -hmm. um, you know, our stand-up paddleboard and the table and some other of the gear we just left outside, and that way I, we had um, the back of the car open for sleeping. That makes sense. What kind of car do you guys typically use? I mean, are you, you're not talking a typical sedan, of course. So you have like a minivan or an SUV. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just put the kids in the trunk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can lower no, the back kidding. the back seats in that situation. But still, <laughs> it doesn't seem very comfortable. <laughs> well, we haven't tried that yet. Um, but we have a Forester. And so I'll just lower the seat down in the Forester. And that creates a, a you know, a, a decent size sleeping area. But generally, when we go camping with the whole family, we also have two dogs, including, you know, a 90 pound Great Pyrenee. And okay. so we take the minivan yeah. in those cases so we can fit everybody in everything. Even with a minivan, I would not want to sleep with my two kids and a dog, two dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love my dog. whole family, but yeah, I don't think I can handle it. <laughs> yeah, it is close quarters, but we're actually lucky. Our um, our latest dog, addition to the family, is named Luna, and she's a, an old Great Pyrenee, and she's deaf, which actually makes her the best camping dog ever because she can't hear anything. So that means that she doesn't get spooked in the middle of the night. <laughs> nice. So you, you know, definitely have camped a lot, but I think one of the things that probably throws people for a loop, or I know even, you know, myself, for example, when you're choosing a campground or you're choosing a destination, what sort of things do you need to be aware of or think about, especially considering like, I know I hear all these dramas about, you know, like reserving campsites a year in advance, and it just seems so stressful and overwhelming. So do you have any tips about how people can manage, like, whether it's a first come first serve or making reservations or how to even choose a campground or destination? Yeah, absolutely. I actually recommend starting with the distance that you want to drive. So instead of just sort of looking at any available campground within your state, if, especially if it's your first time, you probably don't want to drive six hours just to get to the campground. So figure out whatever it is that your limit of driving distance is and sort of look in a radius around where your home base is, looking for um, campgrounds or even just natural areas around that zone. So if it's two hours away, you know, look around roughly like 120 miles away and, and closer. And then I also start with thinking about the kind of terrain that I want to camp. Do I want to go camping near the coast? Do I want to go camping in the mountains? Do I want to go camping in the high desert? And that will kind of um, direct my search of open campgrounds. And you you make such a good point that especially in areas that um, camping is really popular, a lot of the campgrounds get reserved. They get filled up. And in that case, you can do a first come first serve which is a little bit risky, but is doable. And I recommend it as long as you have two backup spots. And actually, that's what I'm doing this weekend. I'm going camping up um, near Leavenworth, Washington, and we're hoping for a first come first serve site. And then I also have a backup first come first serve site nearby. And then the third backup is um, a dispersed camping, which is just sort of camping areas, but with no amenities or facilities. So no vault toilets, no forest ranger, but they do have sort of areas where you can set up camp. But again, it's no reservation. So you can just kind of make your own little spot there. And are those set up where, you know, do most people try and arrive like Friday morning or is it really just hit or miss? Because I'm picturing, you know, some people might try and get there Thursday to be able to get the, you know, whole weekend reserved on a spot or I'm not sure how that works. So do you have any tips on how, you know, is it better to be there at a certain time of day or a certain day of the week? Yeah, a lot of first come first serve spots are, um, they fill up over the weekends, especially during peak times of camping. So in the summer, if you show up at a place that has, say, four first come first serve sites, and you show up on a Friday afternoon, there's a pretty good chance that they will already be taken. So in the summer and other peak times, I recommend if you're looking for a first come first serve site to go midweek 
if you try to go on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or even a Thursday and get there as soon as you can in the morning, you're going to have a better chance of snagging that spot. And one way to make sure that you can get out soon as you can in the morning is to have everything packed up the night before. That way, when you get your kids out of bed, you can just roll them into the car in their pajamas, <laughs> feed them breakfast in the back and get an early start. That way you have a better chance of finding a first come first serve spot. And the other thing I want to point out is that it varies from site to site how long you can stay at a first come first serve site. Some campgrounds don't have any restrictions and other campgrounds have only a one night policy at first come first serve spots. So just make sure to take a close look when you're looking at the campground description to see if there are any restrictions on those types of sites. Great tips. Thanks. And if you don't if know of particular campgrounds, is there any kind of like kayak for campgrounds or, or like any kind of meta search that you can do to help you find different campgrounds? I wish there were a better infrastructure for finding great campgrounds. There is the government's website, um, recreation.gov, which has most of the campgrounds that are related to state campgrounds and so forth. I don't love the site. I wish I could say it's really easy to use and really easy to search. What that does have is a map. If you put in the area, area where you want to go, it'll pull up a map and show like little dots where there are campgrounds. And some of the dots are colored green, I think, that show that those ones have availability during the search time that you want. And the red ones, of course, are ones that do not have availability. So it's, but then again, it doesn't have, you know, great review functions and ways to filter that way. Um, there is another site that we've been using actually quite a lot this summer that's called Hip Camp. Mm -hmm. It's hipcamp.com, and that's basically like an Airbnb, but for camping. So people who have extra land, you know, if they have a ranch or if they have 10 acres out in the woods somewhere, and they make different spots like campgrounds um, around the property, and then they rent it out just like Airbnb. And we've done a number of sites that way over the summer and had really great experiences. That sounds a little bit like Tenter. Have you heard of Tenter? Yes, I have. I think Tenter is bigger on the East Coast and Hip Camp is bigger on the West Coast. Okay. Yeah. And I know with Tenter, we're starting to look into it. Like they have options where they will set it up for you, you know, so you don't have to bring your gear and they'll have some other like glamping options. So that's yeah, something I need to dig into a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it would be I, helpful to have more of these kind of search sites, right? Absolutely. And I think that um, same with hip camp is that you can look for, you know, just campgrounds and you can also look for things like cabins or um, sometimes it'll have like a converted RV or Airstream, something like that. So you can have like a different levels of um, comfort of camping. You can just go totally rough it. Um, with no amenities. And then you could also have some place that's totally outfitted that is just sort of within nature. Yeah, it's definitely challenging. I know when I've looked at just even KOA, because I'm not a camper and I don't know very <laughs> much about it. So I'll be like, okay, well, KOA campgrounds. And then it'll come up with like eight in the state. And then you have to look at each individual site and then keep putting in your information each time. And then even though you put in your information, it might still show you all the availability of campsites, but not necessarily what's open that particular for those particular dates. So it definitely seems like a big rabbit hole to go down to, you know, when you're trying to find something. Yeah, it really can feel that way. So if any um, of your audience is listening, who's a developer and wants a project, <laughs> I think this would be this would be a great website or app to develop um, sort of as an aggregator and um, with all the functionalities of being able to filter and, um, and use tags and so forth. So whenever somebody develops that, I will be 100% on board and I can't <laughs> wait to use it. Cool. So now that we know, you know, a few tips about choosing, you know, where to go, what about actually choosing the actual campsite at your destination? Because I know sometimes there's a lot of options. And do you want to be near bathrooms? Do you want to be away from people? Do you want to be, you know, do you have water hookups, stuff like that? So any tips about things to consider? And, you know, another side note with it being COVID right now, if people are looking at it for social distance, anything they should know about choosing campsites? Yes. 
Absolutely. But before we get into the actual like campsite level, I'd like to just give a couple of recommendations to pick the campground. Before you commit to one and make a reservation, I recommend first double checking the amenities. So make sure if this is something that you need, do they have potable water? Do they have trash collection? Do they have vault toilets or flush toilets? Whatever it is that you need to be comfortable on your camp trip, make sure that the site you have has that because it does vary from place to place. And then especially these days, traveling during the time of COVID, I also recommend looking at the size of the campground. Look at the number of campsites that they have at the campground. And we prefer going with a campground that has fewer sites. So the smaller, the better, especially when you're, like you said um, earlier, with social distancing. It's a lot easier to keep your distance from folks if there aren't 400 campsites in one campground. And actually, I've um, had a lot of luck with hip camp in that regard because most of the state campgrounds are, you know, state parks and they have sometimes hundreds. But we've stayed at hip camp sites that have, you know, just seven or fewer campgrounds or campsites. And then when it comes to picking the actual site, a lot of places will have either a map or an aerial shot, like a Google view shot of their campground setup. With, um, with each of the campgrounds or each of the campsites labeled. So when you're actually um, picking out the place where you will set up your tent, I recommend not being by the bathroom or by a trash collection site. And you would think that that might be because of the smell. And that's one reason why some <laughs> campgrounds don't have um, the best maintained facilities like that. But for me, it's more about the traffic. Those kinds of spots get a lot of people coming and going. And especially if you have kids, you don't want that constant influx of people to like wake them up in the middle of the night. If somebody is coming at two o'clock in the morning to use the bathroom, you don't want a flushing toilet to wake up your two year old. And then in terms of bathrooms, so bathrooms are the one place in many campgrounds where people are going to be in close contact with each other and it has a lot of people coming and going. So for those, I look at the reviews on the campground to see how they are being, how they've been updated for COVID. So for example, um, July, we camped in Central Oregon at Lake Billy Chinook and those bathrooms at the campground had their doors and windows open at all times. So there was a lot of airflow that makes it safer. And Also, you want to look at reviews of people saying, were people wearing masks? Were people being safe and socially distanced or not? Yeah, those reviews are so important, even for for everything, for restaurants, whatever. Like people are being honest about what they're seeing, you know, in the in the staff as well as in the, you know, the, the guests. Absolutely. Yeah. Dig into those reviews and make sure that you're reading ones that have been posted since March when, um, you know, the pandemic really got in full swing here in the U.S. So make sure that you're reading more recent ones to see how things have changed and evolved since the pandemic began. So I know we're coming up on, you know, fall and winter here in the U.S. We, we were just glamping this past weekend and pretty bundled up for one of the nights. Do you have any tips for people? Like, can you still camp in the winter? How should you do it? What should you think about? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to start off by saying that fall is actually one of the best times to camp because um, people have sort of written off camping by September. But that means that campgrounds are oftentimes less busy. You can get campgrounds or campsites that you would have no chance of getting in peak months. So just because, you know, the the leaves are starting to turn colors, that doesn't mean that you can't go camping anymore. Like you said, you do have to have the right gear for the weather. And I actually want to remind your listeners that even during summer months, it can get quite cold at night, depending on where you're going. So always want to make sure to look ahead at um, the highs and the lows, wherever it is that you're heading. As far as winter camping, um, if you're going to be snow camping, that's that's kind of a level up and it could be its own um, <laughs> podcast yeah. episode, probably <laughs> all on its own. And that does require a lot of specialized gear. But if it's just, you know, cold weather, then as long as you have the right warm clothes and also make sure to get a sleeping bag that is rated for um, for a colder temperature, then you're pretty much good to go. The other thing to keep in mind is um, rain. 
So if you're going to be camping a lot in the rain, then just consider if that's something that you want to do, if it's still going to be worth it to go on hikes, you know, in, in the wet weather. And also, if that's the case, then I recommend bringing sort of a canopy or um, like those tents that you sometimes see at weddings, like in mm-hmm. a space where you can be outside but still be dry. That really makes cooking a whole lot easier when you don't have to do it in the wet. Being a Pacific Northwester, we we know that well, right? You always have to plan for rain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This um, August, we went camping on the Olympic Peninsula and got totally rained on one night and didn't have one of those canopies. We ended up making it work. We had a great night in um, inside the tent, you know, eating our dinner and playing Uno, but it wasn't super ideal. <laughs> Cool. So speaking of, you know, being prepared for the weather, that leads us into maybe talking about simple packing tips. And I know packing for camping is a whole, you know, like you said, probably in a whole nother episode. But what do you think are some general tips or advice you have for families who are maybe not accustomed to camping? They're just starting out. What should they know about camping with kids? That is such a good question and a question that I get often, as you can imagine. And I'll share a couple of tips. Um, My first one is that less is more, especially when it comes to clothes. You know, you're going to be outside. Your kids are going to be out playing in the dirt. It's okay if they get a little dusty, if their clothes aren't always um, sort of impeccably clean. And for that, I recommend just packing maybe one or two sets, uh, one or two changes of clothes for each day that you're going to be there. So I don't change my clothes or my kids clothes whenever they get dirty. I just kind of let them be, you know, dirty while we're camping. And that's something that um, really helps keep our, um, the amount of stuff that we bring down to a minimum so that we're not each bringing a full on suitcase. The other thing that I recommend also that helps keep things a little bit cleaner is to put a tarp underneath your um, underneath your tent and also have like a mat to wipe your feet on. We use those mats that are actually um, like dog mats. They're sort of like these big like loop piles to make like a carpet and they are amazing at catching dirt. So we put one of those at the very entrance of our tent so it traps a little bit of dirt. It doesn't take up much room and it really um, gives you a lot of bang for your buck. And then one thing that I would not recommend underpacking is wipes. Especially if you've got younger kids, packing an abundance of wipes is going to make your life easier and it will make camping more fun. That way you can wipe off their face or wipe off their hands without, you know, a whole big production. Yeah, those are some good tips. Do you also, I know, you know, my in-laws who used to do a little bit of camping when their kids were younger, one of the things they swore by was using, instead of suitcases, they used like Rubbermaid bins for people's clothes and shoes and like everybody's shoes would be in one bin and then everybody's clothes would be in another. Do you guys do sort of like that or do you stick to pretty traditional, you know, duffel bags or suitcases? We actually do suitcases for a couple of different reasons. We bring those small ones, like my kids each have their own suitcase. And we do that because when you open it, it opens basically into two halves. So you can keep their clothes on one side and then, you know, their pajamas and stuffy on the other side. So it keeps things a little more organized that way. And also I found that when we tried to pack in like a duffel or even one of those Rubbermaid bins, we ended up making a big mess because we would have to rummage through it all in order to find the one thing that we needed that is inevitably at the bottom (laughs) of the bin. So we try to not stack anything horizontally. And this goes for our clothes as well as our food and any camping supplies that we bring, but rather stack them vertically like books on a bookshelf, sort of like Marie Kondo recommends that you do with everything. And that just makes getting to whatever you've packed so much easier. And the one other note that this is one of my favorite things that we do when we're talking about packing is we bring a big cloth laundry bag and we put it in the corner of the tent and everybody's dirty clothes when as soon as they take them off, they go straight into that laundry bag. That way the dirty clothes aren't mixing with the clean clothes and they're not just strewn all over the tent. And it makes it really easy to do your laundry when you get home. All you do is just dump the whole thing in the washer and you're good to go. Yeah, I think that goes with any kind of family travel, those, you know, big laundry baskets or making sure each person has like a laundry bag to use 
comes in so handy because, you know, we've all been in that where you open up your suitcase and you're like, wait, did I wear this on that trip? I can't remember now. And then you end up washing it anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if you are um, camping too, like you wear a sweatshirt by the campfire, do you really want to put that back into yeah. your um, <laughs> clean clothes bag and have everything smell that way too? Yeah, and those plastic bins, like we just took a one of those big plastic bins to keep out, you know, any animals and also to keep out moisture, but they take up so much room in the car too, you know, whereas like a duffel or something, you can squish it around, like fit it into more places. So I mean, maybe I just need to start thinking about like smaller bins if I were to do that. But I think that would be maybe another downside of the, the Rubbermaid bins. Yeah, the the whole idea of Tetrising everything into the car is, you know, maybe a part skill and part art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but having things that can be easily stacked and not crush the things underneath definitely helps. But like you said, having something that can fit into little nooks and crannies or squeeze into a random open spot is also helpful. And that is more like a duffel or or even like stuffing your pillows or an extra blanket in those little like, random crannies. And do you bring like a an air mattress or, or a mat for everyone, or do you just go right on just sleeping bags on the on the ground? We have come to the point in our camping life that we sleep on an air mattress. Mm -hmm. And probably the hardcore campers listening to this are going to roll their eyes at me, and that's okay. <laughs> but we have just found that, um, that we have a lot better time camping, not only at night, but also throughout the day when everyone can get a decent night's sleep. And so we do bring along an air mattress. Um, we found that it works better than even the camping pads, even the inflatable camping pads. And we're just happier when we get a, a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And it does take up, you know, some room that I would love to have back. But it is an investment that we've made that has paid for itself a million times over. You do not have to explain that. And remember, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how many hardcore campers are listening to Vacation Mavens, but I'm sure there are a lot of moms or dads out there that are probably like, yeah, I want to be comfortable. So I'm pretty sure I just vote for like the cabin that has a mattress. I'm just yeah. going to go that route <laughs> or right, the glamping exactly. tent with the full, you know, bed. That's that's my <laughs> level of camping. <laughs> we yeah, found this cool. Yours. We found this cool pad this summer that my daughter has been using and which folds up like nice and small, um, which she likes. And it has like one side that like reflects the heat or, you know, absorbs it. So like that's kind of cool and it folds up really easy. But um, I, I'm all for comfort. So, yeah, trust me. Like, don't don't worry about that there. <laughs> Good to know. Good. Well, I know you have some other like family camping hacks on your website and stuff. So we'll definitely link to those in our show notes. But do you, you know, just to talk about what you do when you are at the campsite? What so one thing our family struggles with is of course we go out and we do things, but when we're sitting around, we kind of just like, okay, we lit a fire. Now we're gonna stare at the fire. Like what, <laughs> you know, what kind of activities do you like to do with the family, like on your campsite? Yeah, there's a lot to be said for open-ended outdoor time, but I also have two kids whose favorite phrase is, mom, what can I do that's fun for me? So we do end up planning some activities for our camping trips. My favorite, actually, sort of uh, genre of activity is outdoor crafts and art projects. I have a whole post of them over on my website, a lot of them can be done with just a couple of art supplies, like maybe some paper or cardstock, some paint, like washable tempera or finger paints, and some glue and yarn. And with those four supplies, you can do dozens and dozens of art projects. My kids love making nature collages, so they'll spend a half hour wandering around the campground, picking up pine cones and leaves and sticks and strands of ivy, and then bring them back to the campsite and make these amazing, beautiful works of art with them. Um, also, they're obsessed with making fairy houses, so they'll collect things like bark and sticks and so forth and create these buildings for fairies that they'll check through all throughout the time that we're camping to see That's if really any cute. fairies have moved in. That's so I mean, fun. it's it's beyond adorable. And then, you know, as we as we camp, we add to them. So if I braid a bunch of dandelions together, then, you know, they'll add those and it suddenly becomes a zip line for the fairies. Oh, yes. <laughs> so they get really creative. 
And one of the other things that my kids love every single time that we do it is making a, um, a fairy wand, or you can call it, you know, like a superhero wand or whatever it is that floats your kids' boats. But you just take um, a sturdy stick and then collect things like flowers, blades of grass, seed pods, things like that. And you bunch it together at the tip of one of the ends of the stick. And then you wrap yarn around it and create this sort of like wiggly ended wand that just they, they play so much with it and create all these different imaginative games. And it's always a hit with every kid that we see go camping. That's very creative. And another, just a, a brief addition to that, um, if, even if your kids aren't into art or if they get bored of making collages, my kids also love to explore and map, map the campground. So they pretend that they're explorers who have just arrived in this undiscovered land and then they go about and map it. And sometimes they'll create treasure hunts for us that we'll have to follow along on the map and find the treasure. <laughs> and along those lines, we also print out little mini nature booklets so that they can go around and examine, you know, different kinds of moss or they observe a bird and they make their little notes or drawings. And even pre-readers can do this and they can, you, know, you can draw a picture or ask a parent to write down an observation. And we create these camping buckets for them, just like a regular bucket and stick in this nature book plus, um, you know, some pencils or a pen and a magnifying glass and little like pinchers so that they can pick up things. And these camping buckets, I swear, lead to just endless fun. They occupy themselves for hours with these things. Kim, does that make you miss traveling with younger kids? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> right now, I'm, just I'm thinking like, like, oh, I remember those days. Yeah, and now the teens, not so much. I, like, I don't <laughs> think I was that. I wasn't even still even that age. I wasn't that creative at like giving my kids ideas on that. I mean, that's that's awesome. It sounds like so much fun. But I I do miss those days of the young kids that they would just like lose themselves in this imaginative world and could just entertain themselves, especially if you have siblings. I think that helps like Tamara, you know, with Hannah being an only child, you probably were right there along with her, you know, finding the yep. discoveries and all of that. Yep. And so I, I think that's, it's always fun. And I think that's awesome. So those are, those are clever ideas. We'll be sure to link to them in the show notes. So if people are planning to travel, you know, go camping with young kids, they have some fun ideas to set them on their way. Sure. Let's talk about one thing that I know is probably, you know, I know Tamara loves food and we love dining out when we travel together. So when you camp, it's a little different. So how do you recommend people plan for prepping for meals? Or do you have any favorite campfire meals that you guys do? It sounds like, you know, you're not RVing, so you don't have a kitchen set up. So what sort of, you know, tips do you have for meals? Yeah, you know, if you go on Pinterest and search for camping meals, inevitably you get like these gourmet concoctions that, you know, are calling for fresh caught rainbow trout and, <laughs> and the ingredients like capers or what or whatever it is. And that's not our style of eating while camping. And that's okay if that is you. But we're still in the stage of, you know, our kids eat like six different foods. <laughs> and so we don't go full on gourmet when we're camping. That said, when we do go, we prep as much as we possibly can before we go. Because I don't know about you two, but I don't want to spend an afternoon or even an hour or a half hour of my camping trip cutting things and trying to shoo away flies and hoping that the dirt doesn't get into the meal. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of our standard meals is a foil dinner. And so we'll cut together all of the ingredients. So things like sweet potatoes, onions, broccoli, carrots, and so forth. And I put it in a big Ziploc bag with olive oil and the seasonings. And then that whole bag goes into the cooler. That way, when it's time to make the foil dinner, all I have to do is put out a piece of tin foil, dump in a portion of this mixed together vegetables. And then we also will often put like a garden burger, like a veggie burger on top to make it a complete meal. And then you just stick that whole thing in the coals and wait about 20 minutes and voila, there you have like a delicious, complete, healthy dinner. That's awesome. Yeah, it's beyond um, yeah. the traditional like hot dog on a stick, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. I was just thinking like I'm so boring when and unimaginative when it comes to this. We were just talking about it this weekend because 
I made uh, chili again. Kim will probably laugh because <laughs> I made it like the last time we went away and it was a, you know, like a cabin and I didn't want to cook because it's just like so easy just to reheat and we're eating it. I'm like, I really need to come up with other ideas. Hannah and I did this whole like backcountry cooking like thing when we were in Jasper and we made we made like chai Fresh caught tea rainbow and cow- trout. No, like all, all kinds of amazing things. And I'm like, yeah, and, and I'm here I am just reheating my chili again. <laughs> Just send one out for some rainbow trout. Yeah. (laughs) And there's something to be said for that, something that you can just warm up. And I do that too. Like I'll bring, generally I'll bring my leftovers, whatever leftovers are in the fridge from, you know, the day before we went camping and I'll throw that in the, um, in the cooler. And those I generally eat for lunch because I just want something quick and easy to grab. And it doesn't have to be like fancy when you're actually cooking a meal, like the, kids oftentimes will like doing some aspect of DIY. So like you can do that even with something as simple as a quesadilla or a pizza. So you can take a tortilla and, you know, put on the cheese and have all the toppings set out, whether that's, you know, like tomatoes or chicken or tofu or beans or whatever it is, and then have the kids make their own. And you can cook that over the fire in like a big cast iron skillet. Or if you have a burner, then you can just warm it up over the burner in like a propane burner with a a pot on top and kids really get into doing the make it yourself meals for themselves yeah I think kids always love that like getting to have their selection of what they put on stuff is it's always a a hit (laughs) absolutely and then I am going to make one quick plug for something that I have gotten some pushback on and seems very controversial but I'm going to explain it all so we actually I mean s'mores are maybe the most quintessential campfire food, right? And generally when you think of s'mores, you think of doing it at nighttime around the campfire. And with younger kids especially, that just leads to these crazy sugar buzzes right before bed. And it's already can be challenging to get your kids to sleep in an unfamiliar space and like an unfamiliar situation. And then adding, you know, three marshmallows worth of sugar on top of that um, just makes things more challenging. So we actually eat s'mores during the day. One of our favorite times to break out the s'mores is actually right after breakfast because we'll usually light a morning fire. And then as it's dwindling before we go off on our hike or whatever we're going to do for the day, as it's dwindling, the coals are perfect for roasting marshmallows. And so the kids will sometimes do their marshmallows in the morning and then they're not bugging us the rest of the day of when they can make their s'mores. Hey, to everyone, each their own. I know my morning bun that I get from Starbucks probably has as much sugar as a s'mores, so. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and then they have the rest of the day to run off their sugar. Yeah, exactly. Then maybe they won't complain on the hikes, you know? (laughs) I'm not sure about that. (laughs) But you you can always hope. Cool. So um, before we wrap up, just, you know, I wanted to also ask if you had any favorite gear that you would recommend since you have so much experience with this. I don't have particular items, but I want to put in a plug for REI because I think that their products are some of the best in the market. Um, And when you come to some things, like it doesn't really matter like what brand propane stove you have. I think, you know, a propane burner is a propane burner. But when it comes to things like your tent or your sleeping bag, you do not want to skimp. One year we bought a tent at, you know, like a regular discount sporting goods store, and it didn't even last the season. So our next tent, we upgraded to one from REI, and we've had it now for five years, and it's still in excellent condition. It's, you know, it could have just come out of the box. And it's also easy to set up. Um, Whenever you're looking into buying something that requires any setup, especially for family camping, look at all the reviews and see how people find if it's easy or difficult to set up because when you get to the campsite at four o'clock and your kids are just like wanting to run around and all you want to do is kick back with a little sundowner and enjoy the outdoors, like you do not want to spend 45 minutes wrestling with the tent poles. 100%. That's a good tip. And I also wonder, have you heard, because I know some people, so if you're just starting out and maybe you don't want to invest in all the gear before you determine if it's even something your family is going to like, aren't there places, I don't even know, REI might do it, where you can rent sort of a package and you can borrow the gear for, you know, kind of like renting ski gear, but don't they, I, I think some places do that. 
You know, I haven't looked into that as much because um, we have, you know, we've invested in our gear and we we have it for years now. But I have seen advertisements for a company that will give you, like you said, like a whole kit. Um, I also see it among my friends and then on Facebook, um, like free and trade groups or neighborhood groups. People ask to borrow things all the time. And I think that's a great way of saving resources, both in terms of money. Like if you're not sure if that you want to spend the rest of your life camping, like maybe, maybe you don't need a tent, but also resources in terms of natural resources. Like it takes energy and it takes materials to make these things. And if you're going to buy something brand new and then it just sits in your garage for the next decade, like that's not really a great use of resources either way. So I have seen a growing trend of families borrowing things from each other, whether that's a camp stove or a tent or a paddle board or whatever it might be to sort of complete their gear for a camping trip. That's yeah, you're right. really good to think about. I, yeah, it is. It's a good mind mindset. And like you said, we have a local mom's group and I see that all the time. People are like, hey, we're headed out. Does anyone have a, like you said, paddle board or a kayak we can borrow and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. that's great. And uh, A lot of libraries now do that, too. They have like a library of things um, where you can borrow things from, you know, like a badminton set to snowshoes. And they do have some camping stuff, too. Well, we're going to wrap up now, Catherine, and we'll ask you the question that we ask all of our guests. And that is, what do you like to wear when you travel? My kids, when they're older, I'm sure are going to laugh at me because one of my go-to pieces of like my travel outfit is a fanny pack. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, They're back back in style. (laughs) (laughs) I am not a cool mom. I wear a fanny pack um, just because it's so easy. But I've actually found that I need that less lately because I have found a pair of pants that I'm obsessed with. They're from the brand Alder, which is a sustainable and um, ethical company. They, you know, they pay all of their workers like living wages and they're totally transparent on the website about the factories where the clothes are made. And um, they're called open air pants and they are breathable. They're stretchy. They're comfortable. They have 10 pockets, including some that zip. And I love them because I can go from, you know, like driving four hours to wherever it is that we're camping straight to hiking or paddle, even paddle boarding um, without changing my clothes. And I am next level obsessed with them. And then besides that, basically, I laugh at myself because everything else I own is from Columbia (laughs) (laughs) or Eddie Bauer. Um, Columbia, all of their clothes are so well made. They, you know, they dry quickly. Some of them have SPF in them, or I guess it's called UPF. And um, I basically like all of my summer clothes are Columbia. Tamara and I are Columbia fans. They have like my favorite pair of pants that I like. So, yeah. Yeah, it's hard not to be. I I (laughs) love the company. And the Eddie Bauer Mm -hmm. fleeces, you can't go wrong with those either. Yeah. I I mean, if if I'm wearing something camping and it's not Columbia, 95% chance it's Eddie Bauer. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about the book that you wrote, So Virtual Travel Activities for Kids. Uh, Maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit about, you know, what's in that book and where they can find it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it can be found on ebook or paperback on Amazon. And that's really easy to find is just virtual travel activities for kids and it'll come right up. And um, it actually, I wrote it over a couple of months at the very beginning of the pandemic when I was absolutely stir crazy and was just sort of dissatisfied with the kinds of virtual travel activities that I was finding online. All of them were, you know, like, oh, well, just like visit this museum website or like stare at the computer while it shows you, you know, like this palace or whatever. And that wasn't interactive. And I, my kids were already spending enough screen time um, without that. And so I wanted them to have a way to explore the world, even though we were stuck at home, in a way that was more interactive and fun that felt more like play and less like an obligation or a chore. And so I came up with these, there are, there are probably around 200 different activities throughout the book that teach kids about the world um, through play and also incorporate different like school school subjects like geography or math or engineering or even like music, dance, um, movement and things like that. And 
Um, they're really easy to set up and do with your kids because I'm also a busy mom who doesn't have time to hunt for obscure supplies or spend an hour after the kids go to bed prepping something. So it's all really straightforward. And, um, and I've been actually hearing from a lot of readers that they are using it to complement or supplement their online or distance learning with their kids this year because, as we all know, school looks a lot different right now. Yeah. And so what age is, is it best for? It's best for kindergarten through fifth grade. So elementary years are sort of the target audience. When I wrote it, my younger daughter was in preschool and she enjoyed a lot of the activities. And a friend of mine is using it with her 13-year-old also. So a lot of the activities are fairly adaptable, but are written for the elementary school set. That's great. And I believe you've agreed to give one away to one of our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to share the love. So what we are going to do is we are going to post about this episode on the Vacation Mavens Instagram account. It's at Vacation Mavens. So if you go to Instagram and find uh, the picture with uh, a tent and, (laughs) uh, you know, find it about this episode, go ahead and leave a comment. You can tell us, you know, maybe what you've been doing during this you know, lockdown or tell us, you know, where you would like to camp or anything, anything that you want. Just leave us a comment. You'll be entered to win a copy of the book. Yeah, and I would love to just send that over to whoever wins the giveaway and, um, yeah, just help them and their families figure out something fun to do that's not going to take a lot of effort. That's very nice, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to be excited about that. So why don't you let our listeners know where they can find you online, and do you have any fun trips? We already know that you're headed up to Leavenworth, which is my neck of the woods, and I know that's that's an amazing place, but anywhere else you're headed in the next month or two? Absolutely. Well, I post at least weekly on toandfrofam.com. That's to T O and A N D fro F R O fam F A M dot com. And I'm on all the socials at um, to and fro fam. And then you already mentioned my book, um, which is on Amazon. And I also have courses related to family travel, um, including one that's specific to COVID time travel at to and fro fam dot my Kajabi dot Com. And you mentioned um, my weekend's camping trip to um, the area around Leavenworth, which I'm so excited about. And I'm going to be going stand up paddle boarding on Lake Wenatchee. And um, then I have a couple of other trips planned to the Oregon coast. And that's sort of my happy place. So I cannot wait. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Catherine, for spending time with us. And every all of our listeners look forward to that giveaway at Vacation Mavens on Instagram. Well, thank you both. This has been an absolute blast. And um, I'm always happy to answer any questions um, if anyone ever wants to reach out. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us for another episode. And don't forget, head over on Instagram to at Vacation Mavens and look for that camping post and leave a comment letting us know your favorite camping, you know, spots or if you're heading out to camp or any other travel related thing you want to let us know. Just leave a comment and you'll be entered to win Catherine's book. And stay tuned. Our next episode is going to be another outdoor destination. We're going to be talking about Yosemite National Park. Talk to you later. Bye bye. 